Hi there, I'm El Shank. The vast quantity and quality of Vietnamese modernist buildings designed and constructed throughout southern Vietnam between 1945 and 1975 made Vietnam an unrecognized center of modernism in the world. This presentation recognizes the accomplishment of the Vietnamese people in developing their own modernist architecture that reflects Vietnamese identity based upon their traditional architecture. Unlike most places in the world, the Vietnamese people embraced modernism and it became the vernacular architecture for dwellings throughout Southern Vietnam. Beautiful architectural photography by Alexander Gorel supplements my words here as published in our book, Southern Vietnamese Modernist Architecture. This presentation was originally delivered by me to an audience at the American Center in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam on 28th October, 2020. It was the second in a three-part series presenting modernism and contemporary architecture in Vietnam. So thank you, Monica and the American Center for inviting me back here for the second session on Vietnamese modernist architecture uh, after the first session on modernist architecture in general. And then next uh, session, we'll go into contemporary architecture. So I'm looking at this as a record of accomplishment of the Vietnamese people in developing this mid-century architecture. Um, mid-century architecture that uh, adapted to the tropical climate and expresses Vietnamese identity. Now, obviously, I'm not Vietnamese. Um, so at the end, in the questions, if you think I've come to some wrong conclusions, those of you who are Vietnamese, I don't see a lot of you here, um, but uh, ask questions if you, if you think I'm, I've got it wrong. That's the way I learn, that's the way everybody learns. Uh, so let me know. When I was researching for the book, I kept seeing these references to Vietnamese identity. And it was the stated intention of the architects that were developing the architecture to capture somehow Vietnamese identity. And really what they were looking at was the Vietnamese traditional architecture and the way it had captured Vietnamese identity. And they wanted to do the same with the new modernist architecture that they were developing. Now, I love the intensity of life here. The sights as I walked, especially for an architect walking down the street, seeing all of this beautiful modernist architecture. Uh, the sounds, a little more karaoke than I might like to hear nowadays, but um, the smells, usually good smells, uh, the taste, the food, I love the food. Uh, so this intensity of life here is uh, one of the reasons why I continue to live here. It, it, to me, it, it, uh, it expresses the tremendous energy that's in this culture. Uh, the high density uh, helps to create that, of course, but um, uh, it produces complexity. So I think uh, Vietnamese life in general is quite complex. And architecture is a rich part of that uh, experience in reflecting that energy. The Vietnamese modernist architecture, I think, distinctly captured uh, the complexity of life here, and therefore it reflects Vietnamese identity. Now, Ho Chi Minh City and Southern Vietnam in general, well, all of Vietnam really, uh, is blessed uh, with a good mix of architecture, architectural styles uh, that correspond to its very distinctive history, uh, periods in history here. Um, obviously a colonial history, but it also expresses an identity of Vietnam to outsiders, tourists. So when they come here, of course, they see what they expect to see, French colonial buildings, not as many as they used to, unfortunately. But they also see the bland glass and metal high-rise boxes 
because uh, they're big and therefore they're memorable. And they occupy good sites that unfortunately often were heritage properties before that got torn down. So they, Vietnam at the same time is losing some of its identity as we tear down heritage properties. What the tourists don't often realize is that the bulk of the buildings downtown and definitely throughout the city are modernist because they don't really see them. They have this building here that you see on the left-hand side there at 91 Domkoi Street is a good example. It's one of the um, good examples of modernist architecture here that they developed. So even when I'm walking downtown, I, I, I see the Grand Hotel and my eyes immediately go there. I love it. It's dome, uh, the encrustation of ornamentation on it. Um, it's very eye-catching. Modernist buildings, on the other hand, like the Sea Products building here, I walked by it many times without really looking at it. And finally, I did. Because these are background buildings. But uh, given the diversity of forms and uh, treatment that they have, uh, they provide energy to the city through their, their diversity. So the lesson I learned was that if you just do a little bit of study of the Vietnamese architecture, and perhaps after this hour here, as you go home, you'll walk by some buildings that you would, you may have walked by many, many times, but um, you'll look at them now and you'll see, oh, now I know why, this, why these buildings have value. So modernist architecture came to the city here in the 1930s, uh, 1940s, as um, there was an influx of population into the city. And there was a growth of the middle class. The colonial government had changed their approach to the Vietnamese culture and the Vietnamese people. They were hiring Vietnamese as employees. Uh, they needed places to stay, and Vietnamese developers were uh, building apartment buildings like 14 Tom Dat Dam Street here. Um, to, to accommodate that growth. So it's a very simple, utilitarian, modernist building, one of the first in the city in the late 1930s. And then after 1954, with independence, uh, there was a million refugees came down from the north. Uh, so again, a huge influx of population um, needing housing. So Vietnamese uh, developers and Vietnamese modernist architects responded with uh, Buildings like that one at 151 Nam Ki Koenya Street, um, one of the most beautiful of the apartment buildings uh, in the city and that I really like. And it's still there. It's amazing that it's still there. It's been ready for demolition for a long time, unfortunately. So at the same time, the, the Vietnamese were investing in their economy. They were investing in their future. Uh, they could see that uh, even before independence that uh, colonialism was coming to an end. Uh, so they began to build a new economy to, to supplement the extraction economy of the colonies uh, with a new consumer or export uh, economy. And that became part of their identity of energy and their culture of independence. It also expresses their optimism, investing in the future. Uh, so even in the face of war, uh, they were building uh, factories, lots of factories. I was amazed when I came here in 1971 to see all the factories up and down the, what is now called the Hanoi Highway. It's called the Bing Hoa Highway then. Uh, and around the city, investing in their future, because no matter who won the war, there were still going to be Vietnamese here, still going to be a country. And of course it was. They were also transforming the neighborhoods. Up in the 1930s, even up into the 40s, the Vietnamese neighborhoods were bamboo framed to thatch roof houses. Um, and the colonists were essentially living in two-story row houses in the colonial neighborhoods. I would imagine uh, Lita Chom Street here was probably a colonial neighborhood at the time, but uh, in the 1950s and the 1960s, they cleared all that out and uh, with private construction. They built all of these shop houses and apartment buildings like this one. So the vocabulary of this new modernist architecture really came from the building of all of these shop houses, private shop houses. Expresses uh, the intensity, I think, of Vietnamese life. Uh, but at the same time, what they learned from the Vietnamese traditional architecture was that it's restrained. 
So you have this paradox here, both in life and in architecture, of uh, being very complex, intensive, yet at the same time restrained. And I think the the, the building there with the Dante sign is one of the best examples of that. Now, what they learned from the Vietnamese uh, traditional architecture is very important, and it's really, this is one of the best ways of, of talking about that. Now, all the buildings built after 1940 were modernist, and they were designed by Vietnamese architects. Uh, so this is a good example. It was built as the National Library, occupied in 1971, designed by Vietnamese architects Bui Quang Han and Nguyen Hu Tien, and uh, with consulting by Le Van Lam. And uh, Le Van Lam is important, as you'll see later, because he seemed to have been the go-to expert in Brie Soleil screens, as, which is the major part of this building here. So from their study of uh, Vietnamese traditional architecture, which they did not copy directly, uh, but they learned the principles of it, as you can see here, starting at the top with the floating roof. It's a floating roof, or at least it looks like it's floating, uh, which is a common technique in uh, Vietnamese traditional architecture. The walls stop short of the roof somehow to let the ventilation flow through. In this case, it's even more practical than that. The sun's beating down on that concrete roof and getting really hot and otherwise would heat up the interior spaces but they leave a space, an air space, which provides insulation between the hot roof and the ceiling of the reading rooms below, and it works. And at the same time, it provides that very poetic touch of architecture and the, the floating roof. The building as a whole is a very clear expression of structure, which is a primary characteristic of modernist architecture around the world, clear expression of structure, columns and beams. And of course, the Brie Soleil itself is uh, full of Vietnamese patterns that um, I'm sure many Vietnamese will recognize and have memory of some of those patterns. Uh, the uh, Brie Soleil, Brie Soleil is French word for sun blocking elements. Um, so it also allows a phenomena of nature as the sun's traversing the sky during the day and it pokes through that screen. It provides a very intricate, constantly changing pattern of light on the floor of the reading room within. And these the kind of natural phenomena that Vietnamese people really appreciate. Then moving on further down, uh, what looks like it might be a veranda. A veranda on the traditional buildings usually stuck out from the building. In this case, it's inset, but it provides the same functions. It keeps the sun from heating up the exterior wall behind but it provides great socialization space. And if you've ever gone down to the library and seen students congregating along what um, you might call a veranda, uh, it really serves a good function. And in addition, there's a moat, a water moat around the building, and water is very important in, uh, in Vietnamese traditional architecture. So in this case, it uh, cools the air before it traverses the reading room with, within. So, uh, I went to architecture school in the 19, late 60s in America. The first Earth Day was in 1968. Um, and here we are in 1971. They were using a primary technique of, of uh, environmental mitigating the climate with this moat around the building. It's incredible. These, these people were right on top of things. But the building as a whole is uh, simple and elegant and restrained. In a, as the same as the Vietnamese traditional architecture. And it uses earth tones, the natural colors of natural materials. In this case, the, the cement and the sand that make up the plaster that coats every surface on the building. So I arrived here in 1971 to work here for a year managing construction contracts to uh, Vietnamese contractors, construction contractors on behalf of the U.S. Navy, and I'm thankful to this day that the Navy had me come here, and because that's why I'm here today. We're looking up uh, what is now Lay T. Rank Street as it meets up with Bui T. Swan Street up there around the middle. I was living in a bachelor officer's quarters off around to the left. And as I'm walking down the street, you know, I'm, I'm amazed. There are all of these large apartment buildings are modernist architecture, and they're not like modernist architecture I 
I had seen in books. I had just graduated from architecture school the year before. And um, those of us from America and Europe know that our populations never embrace modernism to any great extent. The big buildings tend to be modernist, but other than that, they're, they're few and far between. Along um, Wen Chai Street, which is parallel to this, 100% of the shop houses in 1971 were modernist. You know, so here I am. I'm in architecture heaven with all this modernist architecture. So obviously the Vietnamese population embraced modernism. Uh, it was overwhelmingly modernist. And then I was truly shocked when I saw this overtly modernist monument because there were no mon modernist monuments in Europe and America in the mid-century. None. So what do I do? I come here. Wow. There it is. Uh, amazing mod modernist monument designed by a Vietnamese architect Nguyen Ki in a design competition in 1967. It was completed in 1969. You know, so there's so much good modernist architecture here that uh, when I talk to students and I say, you know, Southern Vietnam is a center, not the center, but a center of modernist architecture in the world. And they say, no, 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 can't be. The architecture here is too ordinary. Well, yeah, of course it's ordinary to you. You've grown up with it. It's all you've ever seen. And there's so much of it that definitely it has become ordinary here in the culture, even though it's extraordinary in the world. But ordinary is important because that's the definition of vernacular. Now, in linguistics, that word vernacular comes from linguistics, and it means the local dialect, the local way of speaking. So as you might imagine, vernacular architecture is the local way of building. It's what you'd expect people in a given cultural area to build over a given period of time. So when I came here in 1971, this is what I expected the rural vernacular architecture to be. And of course it was. The bamboo framed, that shrift huts uh, were everywhere, especially in the Mekong Delta. But over time, this has changed. In 19, after 1975, there were already lots of factories making cement. Certainly there's a lot of sand in Vietnam. Uh, there were factories making reinforced steel reinforcing bars. So reinforced concrete became the new material, as well as fired brick. There are lots of kilns by then making fired clay brick. So uh, the soldiers came back, they had their version of the baby boom, their families were growing, they wanted more permanent housing, so they would tear down the, uh, the huts and they would build one-story masonry houses and then they moved on to two-story houses. Uh, and this is now the rural vernacular architecture of the past. It's now heritage architecture, if you can find some of them. And this is now the vernacular rural architecture of the present. There are thousands of houses like this up and down the coast of uh, southern Vietnam from Hoi An down through Da Nang. Hoi An's got thousands of them itself. Pastel colors usually around Hoi An and then down through Nguyen Yen and uh, Chang down into the Delta. Differences in styles as it goes down the coast, uh, but uh, usually all having a traditional form like this. Uh, but look at that exquisite modernist detailing around the openings. Uh, you've got a rain shelf around the building, which traditional buildings wouldn't have. And then that exquisite modernist treatment of the plaster. It's, it's, it's just incredible. And we know architects don't design these houses uh, because they're, they're all traditional form. What do they need an architect for? So how, how does architecture get transmitted? around the world? How do ideas get adopted? Well, um, this house is one of about 15 in a village called Katin in the Phuket district of Binden province, north of Wienan. And I suspect, who knows, you know, some house painter. Maybe he saw in a book a, a, a painting by Piet Mondrian from the 1920s, which, which used strong line work and color. But Probably not, but what he might have done is he might have gone down to Da Nang or even uh, Saigon and saw something that piqued his interest. 
so he comes home and he paints his house with some beautiful colors and line work and uh, his neighbors all go over his house and they say, oh, Deplam, beautiful house. And he says to them, well, hey, I can paint your house too. It'll be uh, different colors, different pattern, same, same, but different. Um, and sure enough, by the time he's got done, he's got 15 houses, all with different colors, different patterns, but very similar to this. Incredible. You know, this kind of detailing is so incredibly modernist. It just kills me. Vernacular rural housing. And you know, when I, when I talk with academics about modernist architecture, being vernacular architecture, they say, no, that's impossible. Um, vernacular architecture must be traditional. So I ask them, well, well, what does it take to become traditional? Well, they say about three generations, and if a generation is 21, 22 years, we've been seeing how, we've been seeing modernist architecture here for over 80 years. That's over, well over three generations. So modernist architecture is now the traditional architecture in Vietnam. So I can walk down any street at random, any lane at random in the city here, any of the southern cities, even the rural towns, and I walk down the street and count the styles and I will find that over 70% of them will be modernist. Now these houses are contemporary modernist houses. These aren't mid-century. So you can see the tastes have changed, a lot more colors now, different materials, uh, different forms, but they're still modernist. So the vernacular architecture of southern Vietnam is still modernist. Uh, so the Vietnamese people continue to embrace modernism, unlike hardly anywhere else in the world. Those of us, again, from American Europe know that our populations never embrace modernism. In fact, many people there dislike modernism. But there are a few places in the world, uh, Israel, Brazil, parts of India, especially around New Delhi, uh, where they, the populations embrace modernism. So I'd like to go to those places and uh, compare their modernist architecture with Vietnamese. Um, but you can't travel anywhere right now, and uh, I, don't, I don't have enough money to do it. Uh, so I take Google Street View, and I go down many, many streets, down the cities and in the suburbs and out in the rural areas to make a comparison. I can tell you from my judgment that the Vietnamese modernist architecture is far superior to the dark modernist architecture in those other locations. So again, both in terms of quantity as well as quality, Southern Vietnam is a center, not the center necessarily, but a center of modernist architecture in the world. And then this was confirmed with this project that the population had embraced modernism. Now, of course, the building on the top is the old French Governor General's Palace, so occupied in 1873, renamed the Nordham Palace in the 1920s. In 1954, with independence, uh, the president of the new state of Vietnam and his family moved into it, and they renamed it the Independence Palace. But in 1962, a couple of his own pilots bombed the building in an assassination attempt, which failed. Uh, but they destroyed half the building, so they wound up taking it all down and resolved to rebuild it as soon as possible, using the same foundations, same size of building, um, uh, so they could save some time and money. So they held a quickie design competition, literally one day up in Dilat. And of seven teams uh, that, uh, that they had selected to give schemes, uh, one of those schemes was to rebuild the uh, old Governor General's Palace pretty much the way it was, a few modifications. A couple schemes were European, neoclassical, a uh, scheme or two were uh, Indochine style, that fusion of French Beaux-Arts architecture with uh, Asian ornamentation. One scheme was overtly Vietnamese traditional. And then the seventh scheme was this beautiful modernist masterpiece by Vietnamese architect Ngo Vi Tu. So occasionally, um, 
This will pop up in the heritage groups on Facebook, especially on uh, Saigon Then and Now. And inevitably, somebody will say, oh, I wish they had rebuilt the old Governor General Palace. It was so beautiful. I mean, how could they have done otherwise? You know, think about it. What are you going to communicate to the world as a newly independent country with aspirations to be an industrial age country? So, yeah, we just fought a war, a resistance, millions of people killed, a grinding war of resistance. And yet, you know, we miss the colonial days. You know, we, we think that the European architecture is superior to our own culture. So, yeah, we're going to rebuild it in European architecture. You know, thank God they had the sense to select this beautiful modernist masterpiece that that expresses Vietnamese identity in many, many ways. How could they have done otherwise? So how did all this come about? Well, this building here is a modernist masterpiece in its own. The University of Architecture of Ho Chi Minh City over on Pasteur and Winden Chao Streets. Uh, designed by a fifth year student as his final project. Uh, uh, Chum Van Lam with his advisor, Professor Pham Van Tung, who is a fam one of the famous modernist architects here. He was also the director of the school. Uh, so this was the first phase of three or four that eventually got built. This was built in 1972. Now, this is not the Ecole Superiore de Beaux-Arts of Nguyen de Chin in Hanoi, but it's the direct successor of that institution in Hanoi. The colonial government started the Fine Arts College, the Col de Superior de Beaux Arts de Chine in Hanoi. In 1924, they added the architecture department in 1926. Um, and they had uh, students from both the North and the South. So, one of the first of the Northern architects to graduate was uh, Nguyen Cao Duane. And anybody here from the North will probably recognize that famous Northern architect's name. Uh, graduated in 1931, and he was the top graduate, so they awarded him two years of employment with Le Corbusier and August Pere in Paris. Incredible opportunity. But he came back in 1933 and started the first Vietnamese architecture firm. Colonial government wasn't registering Vietnamese students as architects to do large buildings so they could do villas and houses, and that's what they did. And you look at their work, it was Art Deco or a modernist from the beginning. Uh, Win Tan Fat from the south, from Ben Che down in the Delta, graduated in 19, uh, 1938. And he came back to the south and started the first Vietnamese firm in Saigon in 1941. So there were students from both the north and the south. They all had the same common beginnings, at least. Uh, but in 1945, uh, and, uh, Circumstances of history, everything began to change and they diverged when it became uh, to modernism. And uh, modernism definitely flourished uh, more in the South. Now, Arthur Cruz had graduated from the Col de Beaux Arts in Paris in 1929. And he came uh, to uh, Hanoi to become the head of the Department of Architecture. So he was the head of the Department of Architecture from 1930 to 1954. And we know he was a modernist because he designed this modernist building at the corner of uh, Lee Du Cham and Hai Chum Streets. And we know that he introduced his students to the modern architecture of um, the Americas and Europe at that time. He undoubtedly talked about Walter Gropius, the leader and designer of the Bauhaus, that famous design institution in Germany between World War I and World War II. Uh, he probably talked about Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, who became one of the most premier uh, modernist architects of high-rise buildings. But those two architects worked with uh, high-quality uh, industrial materials, rolled steel sections, stainless steel, huge pieces of highly polished cut granite and marble. None of those materials were available in Vietnam. Um, so the students looked to Le Corbusier because his primary material was reinforced concrete. And there's lots of sand here. Uh, they had factories making cement and steel reinforcing bars. 
So given that material, they naturally gravitated towards the architecture of Le Corbusier. So when you see this building here, the Punjab Capital Complex in Chandigarh, India, built in 1954, this is the Secretariat Building. As you look down this building, there are four different mo modernist motifs down there, but you look on this side, I'm sure the Vietnamese architects could see good ideas in there that they didn't copy, uh, but they would figure out how to apply them in a Vietnamese way here to their tropical climate. Arthur Cruz probably also talked about Frank Lloyd Wright and his prairie houses in, uh, in America, and particularly around Chicago, like the Roby House in uh, 1910. Wide roof overhangs, big expansive terraces, big openings for indoor, outdoor experience. And uh, photographer Alexander Gural found this beautiful villa up in Binh Yung province. It's in our book. Uh, and again, you know, the big wide roof overhangs and the expansive terraces and the big openings for indoor outdoor experience. So I think uh, this might have been inspired by the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright, but obviously it's not the same. They didn't copy it. It's Vietnamese. Uh, but you can see where they got might have gotten might have gotten some inspiration. Now, unlike other Southeast Asian countries, including Kampuchea and certainly Japan, there were no foreign architects other than what these students were seeing in books and magazines. There were no foreign architects here that would conceivably otherwise uh, influence the development of the modernist architecture here. Now, this building is in Japan, the International House of uh, Japan in Tokyo, uh, built around 1954. You know, so they might have seen pictures of this also. This is about as close to Vietnamese modernist architecture as I've seen around the world. Very clear expression of structure, regularity, uh, wide roof overhangs. In Japan, Frank Lloyd Wright had designed two buildings before World War II in Tokyo. Uh, Le Corbusier designed a beautiful museum there after World War II. The Japanese architects were going to the big modernism conferences in Europe in the 1960s. So there was a lot of a correspondence between Japanese architects and foreign architects. Uh, similar correspondence between uh, Van Molly Van and the new Khmer architecture in Kampuchea. Uh, there were foreign architects working there, but there were none here in Vietnamese. So the Vietnamese architects did this on their own. They might have found their inspiration from architects like Le Corbusier, but, uh, or maybe even this, but um, they did it on their own. Now, being an American who was a part of the construction program that we had here during the war years, the, the decade between 1962 and 1972, uh, we built uh, in today's dollars, 40 to $50 billion worth of construction here. You would have thought we would have some influence on the architecture here, but I can tell you we had absolutely none. We were building seaports, six major seaports, deep draft seaports up and down the coast. We built eight major international airports with three kilometer long runways, uh, 200 smaller airports all up and down the country, 3,000 kilometers of highways and bridges, but no buildings, no big buildings. We built the uh, Pentagon East, the uh, headquarters for the, the MACV, the headquarters for the U.S. Army in Long Bin, they were all used prefabricated uh, modular units uh, that never got copied here. So absolutely no, no direct influence, but there was a major indirect influence. We needed a lot of office space in a hurry. We needed a lot of uh, residential quarter space in a hurry. Uh, so we put out requests for proposals to Vietnamese developers to provide these facilities that we needed, and they responded. So using Vietnamese architects, they designed and built all these beautiful modernist buildings of the mid-century that you see that are hotels and apartment buildings today that, that Americans often refer to as that's a BOQ where I live, the bachelor officer's quarter or the the EQ, the Bachelor Enlisted Quarters, where, I, where you used to live, right? Yeah. Uh, so that was our indirect 
um, influence on the modernist architecture here was providing that market for buildings that in the end we didn't ask for modernist architecture. We wanted modern buildings with modern conveniences, uh, but the Vietnamese responded with Vietnamese modernist architecture. Now, modernists began here with, uh, as I said before, with apartment buildings. Uh, this is the Catnat building. Uh, so they started with Art Deco. So 1927, uh, the Tundin Market, very Art Deco, also in 1927. So that was the beginnings with Art Deco. And the French architects continued to do Art Deco buildings around the city, especially Paul Vesser with his apartment buildings that still exist around the city. Uh, Vietnamese architects jumped over them to do modernism, but uh, there weren't any Vietnamese architects yet. So in 1931, the first modernist building was designed by Leo Krast, who worked for the Colonial Public Works Department. It was built to be a uh, school for um, Vietnamese children. Uh, the building off on the uh, right here was an addition built in the 1960s, which is a beautiful modernist building of the mid-century. Uh, but the main building there, definitely a modernist building because it has a very clear expression of structure, columns and beams, very large openings, and uh, those bumps you see on the concrete guardrails are not ornamentation. That's a modernist abstract grid of bumps. It's modernist. So at the same time, they were still building colonial buildings. Uh, so the buildings for the Hui Ba Hua, Bon Hua Company in District 1 that became the uh, Fine Arts Museum buildings, 1934. Uh, but you'll note this is the middle of the three buildings that they use, uh, built uh, originally as an exhibition center. Uh, it's definitely got modern bones because it's got a clear expression of structure of a structural frame and large openings and the, the trellis elements up there are definitely modernist. But they added just enough ornamentation to make it French colonial. So this was an exciting time for architecture in that late 20s, the early 30s as uh, building Art Deco, we're building modernist buildings and we're still building French colonial buildings or Beaux-Arts buildings all at the same time. So. It must have been kind of confusing for a lot of people, but evidently it wasn't confusing for the Vietnamese population because they obviously moved on with Vietnamese modernist architecture. Now my apologies to photographer Alexander Gorel, as originally intended, this photograph has a very nice warm morning tone on the National Treasury Building, built in 1925 along Winway Boulevard with the modernist buildings uh, dark in the background. But I want to make a point about those two buildings, so I overexposed it here. The rounded one you'll recognize as the Bitexco Financial Center Tower, occupied in 2010, designed by American architect Carlos Zapata of New York City. It's an international style building. An international style is a subset of overall modernist architecture around the world. Well, but it was a style that was defined so narrowly. It was meant to have smooth skins, generally to express horizontality, in other words, the floor levels. Uh, so it became ideal for the construction of high-rise, bland, glass and metal boxes around the world that you see even here, of course, in Ho Chi Minh City. We're not immune to these things. Uh, but I will admit that the Bitexco Tower is one of the better designs. Uh, that have been built in the international style. The building in the middle also has a glass and metal curtain wall, uh, but the Vietnamese architects uh, 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 Nguyen Chung Lu and uh, Ngo Deng Van in 2007 designed this building. And they added those uh, silver colored vertical elements that gave it more texture, gave it more interest. And then the building form itself has insets into the building presumably responding to functional needs inside. Uh, so it breaks down the scale of the building. So this follows the principles of the Vietnamese modernist architecture set forth in the mid-century. So it's a Vietnamese modernist building. So what are those principles? What distinguishes Vietnamese modernist architecture? 
Well, this building here at uh, 9 uh, Komchum Lamson, Lamson Square um, in the early 1960s was potentially a pretty bulky building there in the environment. And it was one of these buildings, by the way, that became a VOQ or a VEQ. Do you remember? Anyway, we occupied it for a while. Just by the addition of those brie soleil, again, those sun blocking screens on each floor, it broke down the scale of the building to make it much lighter, much more uh, relatable by humans, human scale. And therefore, it reflects, it reflects the complexity, the intensity of Vietnamese life here. It's, it, it expresses Vietnamese identity. So it's definitely light and lacy compared to its later international style of hotels over here on the right. Uh, Brie Soleil, some blocking screens were also used here on uh, the, the major facade of the uh, Bata Shoe Factory here in District 10 using vertical fins very well integrated into the exterior wall of the building. But you'll notice on the right hand facade here it's completely different. Very common technique of the Vietnamese architects to look at the differing conditions, differing climate conditions. That's a north exposure so they didn't need Brie Soleil here. They used the double wall construction with an exterior courtyard. And then notice how the uh, guardrails and the floor beams bend out a little bit on the ends there. Very poetic touch. You don't see these kind of touches on global modernist architecture, which is more minimalist. Uh, but a, a very common touch in Vietnamese modernist architecture, very poetic. Uh, remember that I mentioned uh, our Vietnamese architect Le Van Lam um, in helping to design the Brie Soleil screens at the General Science Library, also design screens, helped to design screens at the University of Medicine and Pharmacy. Uh, but he designed the whole building here. So he really designed the ultimate Brie Soleil screen here. Originally built as the, called the VAR building at uh, 9 uh, Nguyen Cong Chu Street. This is the Ho Du Mao Street facade that you see here. It's an eight-story building. It's a big, clunky building. Um, but just simply by having this beautiful Brie Soleil screen, double wall construction, breaks down the scale of the building, makes it much lighter, much more relatable uh, to human beings. And even now, 1973, so that's about 47 years, the condition of these, these Brie Soleil elements have not deteriorated of precast concrete, makes you wonder. Um, all of the Brie Soleil buildings that Ngo V2 designed in 50, 55 years ago, still in great condition. So it's a testament to the knowledge that the Vietnamese architects and engineers had about concrete mixes and materials. And then of course a testament to the capability of the Vietnamese construction industry to build large buildings like this and uh, precast the elements, get them hung up on the wall. Tremendous capability here in the mid-century. Now many of the compositions, the architectural compositions of the Vietnamese architects are very abstract, which in general, that's what modern architecture around the world is. This is uh, an addition to the Chan Dai Nia, Nia uh, secondary school or specialist high school uh, along, uh, well, the, the, it was originally a colonial institution called the Tabert School. So the, the original building uh, from the 1980s, or from the 1880s, still exists on the corner of Winyu and uh, Haibachum Streets. Uh, but they added two additions, two buildings in 1960, designed by the same architect, Huynh Kim Mang. Uh, and they're entirely different designs. The building along Haibachum Street is a double wall uh, design, a uh, beautiful composition of parts uh, whereas this building, at the same time, is, is purely abstract. Uh, the white fins there are sort of Brie Soleil, but not really. They're decorative. They're part of a pure abstract composition. So it shows the versatility that these Vietnamese architects developed and had here to design any kind of modernist building. They're both exquisitely modernist, but they're both entirely different. And notice the poetic touch of the uh, floating roof. Many of their designs were very expressive, 
uh, like this one. Uh, it was at 30 Fum Kwan Street uh, in the Dakao neighborhood. Uh, and in the mid-century, uh, this was a neighborhood of uh, embassies, foreign countries. So this might have been designed as an embassy, we don't know. Uh, but one of the things I was impressed with when I came back here in 2005 to live is that, uh, by golly, you know, the, uh, the reunified government, the socialist government, really did a great job of inventorying all of the properties around the city because they grabbed all the good ones, like this one. So in 1975, this building was occupied by the Central Committee of the Communist Party of District 1. So for all these years, they had one of the most beautiful properties in the city. Two years ago, somehow, they lost track of its value, its, its historical value, its social value, and definitely its aesthetic value. And they tore it down and they replaced it with a blah government-style building. Really unfortunate. There's another one. Uh, this became the Social Services Center for Fung Four in the Tunbin District. A beautiful, expressive composition. Incredible. And the point to make here is, you know, somebody paid for this. You got those redundant roof elements up there that aren't really acting as roofs anyway. They're decorative. Um, but somebody paid for this architecture. And for all the examples I've been showing you, I've got all these elements that make up very intricate complex architecture and people were willing to pay for it in those days. The shop house at 411 uh, Windkeem Street in the Funyuan district, uh, you can't find it anymore because it's been covered up with a bland glass and metal uh, curtain wall for a dentist's office. Uh, I, I tried to see if the trellis elements were still there and I couldn't see them. Um, but the, uh, you know, those beautiful, intricate trellis elements up there. And they've probably been there for 50 years and they're still in great condition. But it was elements like this and elements like this very interesting um, element along the horizontal element there. You know, when you look at modernist architecture around the world, you don't see architecture like this. Nowhere else in the world. Uh, so when I say that... Uh, Vietnamese architecture is unique in the world. It's not just a cliche. Everybody says that, right? That their architecture is unique, but this is truly unique. You cannot find architecture like this anywhere else in the world because it's uniquely Vietnamese. Uh, similar with here at 96 Cho Van Liem Street out in District 5, another beautiful composition of parts you know, but when you look at uh, these long white elements here, uh, supposedly they're planters. You probably haven't seen a plant in the 50 years this house has been there. Um, in modernist architecture on the world, we do not use ornamentation. In fact, uh, Adolf Luce wrote a book at, uh, in the early 1900s called Ornamentation is a Crime. So modernist architecture don't do, do not use representational ornamentation. But when you look at these kinds of elements, uh, you know, they're, they're architectonic, they're architectural shapes, so they're not ornamentation. But we have to admit that they're decoration. They're there for decorative pur purposes, unlike the principles of global modernist architecture. And this is what creates Vietnamese identity. This is what expresses complexity and intensity of life here. So, as a result, Vietnamese modernist architecture in general is much more complex than the more minimalist global modernist architecture. Now, Ngo Vi Tu, who designed the Independence Palace, went to school at Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris, graduated in 1955, and he entered the prestigious, for the, the competition for the prestigious Grand Prix de Rome that the French government handed out. There was a prize for artists, and there was a prize for architects every year based on a design competition, and he won. And that entitled him to three years of studying classical architecture in Rome at the Villa Medici for the French Academy there. Um, and then in 1962, he, he was designated an honorary fellow of the American Institute of Architects. This was before he had designed the Independence Palace. 
So just based on the prestige of the Grand Prix de Rome, they made him a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. That's, that's pretty good. The first Asian architect to be so designated, even before the famous Japanese architects. So he came back, 1959, designed this incredible masterpiece, this villa here at 6 uh, Nguyenhui Tung Street in the Bintan district. Uh, and again, you know, somebody paid for this, right? These, these double floor elements, these double roof elements, which are integral parts of a masterpiece of a composition. Uh, it was paid for by Nguyen Ngoc Thu, who was the vice president of the Southern Vietnamese government from 1956 to 1963. And then he became the prime minister for the year while the generals were fighting over what kind of a government they were going to have. And so it was his villa. Vietnamese architect Ko To Kom Van was incredibly expressive in his architects often used butterfly roofs, V-shaped roofs, a lot of angular forms, as you see here, hoods over the windows, incredible expressive architecture. One of his buildings was just demolished on Nguyen Van Choi Street a month ago. Another expressive building, that was a commercial building, so it was a lot more restrained than this particular villa. Um, this villa is at 27 uh, Ngo Toi Niem Street in, in District 3. Uh, during the Tet Offensive of 1968, huge neighborhoods in District 5, parts of District 10, District 11, District 1 were destroyed, completely destroyed. They need to build a lot of housing in a hurry. So foreign governments like Canada paid money. The Vietnamese architects designed a lot of housing like this. So on the left, you see a housing that was at 100 Kogang Street, several structures. In that, they were all torn down three or four years ago, but Alexander Gurel got there just in time uh, to record them before they were gone. And then this beautiful photograph by Alexander here at 2 uh, Tongui Tan Street in District 5 that shows this incredible light pattern that results from the, the ventilation blocks in these stair towers. You know, there's a couple of lessons that we've forgotten now that are demonstrated in these mid-century housing projects. It's double wall construction, so it keeps the sun from heating up the exterior wall of the units inside. So uh, there's good cross ventilation, so you don't need air conditioning. And then at nighttime, it cools down and a great socialization space along those exterior corridors at night. And then these stair towers are huge. So you meet your neighbors up coming up and down and uh, you might get a little bit of space to stand off for a few minutes and, and talk. So these buildings were very sociable. And we've lost those lessons. You don't see that in the new condo towers uh, that are being built today, which I think is very unfortunate. So we're coming to a summary here, one of the best of the Vietnamese modernist buildings, uh, the Health Education and Information Center at 59 Winti Min Kai Street, which is at the corner with Kak Man Tang Dam Boulevard. And I think it shows that Vietnamese modernist architecture is a much more vibrant version, again, of global modernist architecture. Because it provides that quest for identity and spirit that architects have been looking for in modernist. And they, they definitely found it here in, in the Vietnamese identity that expresses. Because it's more relatable to humans. It's more human scale. These, these brie soleil elements, these triangular elements, uh, do a great job of, of, of breaking down the scale of the building. Yet they're a beautiful abstract element in design. And then down on the other end there, you got your double wall construction, this articulation of ins and outs and lights and, and uh, solids and voids. Uh, lights and darks were very important in the Vietnamese modernist architecture to break down the scale of the building, to make it express that intensity and that complexity of Vietnamese life, which is what they learned from their study of Vietnamese traditional architecture. So the big question, why did the Vietnamese people embrace modernism unlike other people around the world? Well, the Southern Vietnamese people have a long history of dealing with foreigners. The trade routes up and down the coast in the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries 
coming from uh, Europe, uh, going through around the Horn of Africa, through India, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, coming up the coast on their way to China. They stop off at the port of Pre Nakor, which was the predecessor here of Saigon and then Ho Chi Minh City. And the Vietnamese would probably sell them a few things, do some trading and learn some new ideas. Uh, but they would think about those ideas and they'd figure out how to make them Vietnamese. So they were used to learning new ideas from other people, but making them Vietnamese. Uh, and kind of as a result, they're not beholden to iconic religious architecture. The, the Cham Towers of the Champa civilization here um, were very beautiful towers, but they, they didn't become icons or models for architecture here. And therefore, unlike uh, Kampuchea, unlike Thailand, where the temples are extremely important in the life of the people there, they, their houses tend to look the same because they focus on the temples. Whereas here, people are focusing on their family and they want their houses to express their personal identity as well as the identity of the country. And in that process, they developed a sense of design that many other cultures do not have based upon what they remembered of Vietnamese traditional architecture. So it became their expression of independence from the colonialism, represented their freedom. Uh, therefore, they're not beholden to the past. They could be modern in their thinking and in their accomplishments. So me, Vietnamese, are just naturally optimistic people. They look towards the future. And modernism allows that future to happen, express their aspirations, what they want for them and their families, and the place of their country in the world in the industrial age. However, we are in exciting times, once again. Exactly 100 years ago, the exciting times in, uh, did I mess up? Yeah, exactly 100 years ago, I mentioned the exciting times here, both in Vietnam and around the world, developing the beginning of modernist architecture. Today, we are seeing modernist buildings are still being built. Modernism isn't dead yet. We're also building faux colonial buildings, um, houses, shop houses, as well as apartment buildings and hotels, people looking to the past. Maybe a reaction against modernism, perhaps, but they're looking to the past. It's gonna be a dead end, but at the same time, Vietnamese architects are developing an information age architecture of houses and small buildings. So that's what I'd like to talk with you about in the next 18th of November here. Information age architecture, the new architecture that's beginning to move beyond modernism. And the central message of that will be that I think Vietnamese architects are leading the world today in the design of information age houses and small buildings. So I Hope you all come back for that. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. You have... Uh, the microphones, uh, we have a questioner up front. Um, so the BEQs and the BOQs were purpose built? Uh, they were, a lot of them were built in response to a request for a proposal that said we needed so many square meters of space, so many rooms, so much size of rooms. So yeah, to some degree, it was purpose-built. Because I was under the impression when I first arrived here in 1969 that buildings were, had already existed and were leased by the U.S. government from the Vietnamese government. Yeah, some of but them I'm were. I'm learning from you that they were purpose-built. Many of them some, were purpose-built. Some were purpose-built. Others were already existing buildings. Okay, thank you. Back there. Okay. 
So you said earlier that Vietnam is a, a center for modernist architecture, right? So what are, the, what are the other places that you can say is the, one of the centers of the modernist Sorry, architecture? I didn't catch the last part. Uh, what are the other places that you think um, would can, or can be called, you know, right. the centers? Of yeah, well, of modernism. course, there's major centers like Chicago, where the development of office buildings uh, in the 1880s, beginning of modernism in the 1880s, Chicago is still a center of modernist architecture. But I mentioned Israel, Brazil, parts of India, where vernacular architecture, the housing of people, ordinary housing of people is also a center, makes them a center of modernist, of their kind of modernist architecture. So I got a couple of questions here from the Facebook people. Good to hear from them. Okay, so the first one, in your opinion, what led to the end of modernist architecture in Vietnam? Hmm. Is it war? Changing in politics or government? Changing in thoughts and architectural education? or simply because modernism is boring. So people decided to adopt a new form of architecture. Um, okay, well, I'm a little bit confused myself with this question because if we talk about what led to the end of modernism, well, modernist architecture here, we're talking about today, right? We're talking about, is there an end to modernist architecture here? I don't think so yet, even though there's a lot of new styles now being built here, and a lot of the shop houses now are modernist, but they're definitely not Vietnamese modernist because they no longer are expressing Vietnamese identity, which I personally feel is very unfortunate, but that's the direction of cities all over the world. So, you know, we can't talk about at this time, was it war? No. Was it change in politics? No change in architectural education, I don't know, but uh, it's as if you really you're referring to right after World War II, I think, and uh, therefore what caused the change that created Vietnamese modernist architecture after World War II. Um, partly it was war, the necessity to build uh, the industries required to prosecute the war, housing to house people, coming in from the provinces, both in search of economic opportunities as well as escaping warfare, moving into Saigon. Um, the architectural education of the day was definitely changing things. Uh, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts to Linda Chin in Hanoi was definitely changing the outlook of, of architecture here in the country. So all of these factors that are mentioned definitely led to the beginnings of Vietnamese modernist architecture here, not the end of Vietnamese modernist <coughs> architecture. Okay, so back to the audience here. Go ahead. You got a microphone? Let me catch this gentleman over here and then I'll get back to you, Nana. I'm sorry, but I have a problem of understanding English so, okay. and hearing. Yeah. So, but I have a question. You, you're an architect, as me. Okay. I have. I think architecture has a very big problem, serious problem, because I think it is disconnected with the problem of society. So, when we talk about modernism, when we talk about influences of different type of architecture you know, in Vietnam. But I don't see exactly, but I think the problem of architecture, we should come back to, to connect with society because our, our profession is how to, to design, you know, living space for people and not just architecture, the big name, the big word of architecture. So that for me is the problem. Okay. Well, I agree to a certain extent to the architecture of today. The new condo towers that we're building is definitely separated from society. I agree with you. Um, but the architecture of housing in particular and shop houses, all of the housing in the country that was developed in the 50s and 60s here, you know, didn't start with architects, really. 
you know, Vietnamese modern architecture was developed by the people themselves. There weren't enough architects here to design all of those shop houses and apartment buildings that got built here. So how does that happen? Well, the Vietnamese people themselves understood what they needed. Well, I guess I don't need that, do I? Uh, Nana, I'll get back to you in a second. But uh, the, um, the Vietnamese people understood what they needed to serve their needs, but they also had this need to express Vietnamese identity, in my opinion, their personal identity, and they found it through their memories of Vietnamese traditional architecture, what they liked about that, and they could see what the architects were doing. And then they adopted those ideas, and they didn't know it was called modernism. They didn't know what modernist architecture was, but they saw some things that they could use, and the Vietnamese people themselves did it. You know, when I started writing my book, there were no books by Vietnamese architects had been written about this architecture. None about this architecture from the 1940s on. There weren't any. Um, and that surprised me because I expected to be able to build upon what Vietnamese architects had already d described or defined about Vietnamese architecture here. And there wasn't any. There's a book coming out. Um, by a Vietnamese, a young Vietnamese architect that, uh, uh, that is going to define how did this happen? How did the Vietnamese people themselves uh, develop this architecture based upon the Vietnamese traditional architecture to satisfy their needs and not only for living space, but also for identity. So I hope, I hope that answers your question. I understand the principle that you were asking about. Yeah, we architects have a big yeah. problem. Yeah, <laughs> definitely today. Okay, so Nana. My question is, uh, going back to the shoe factory, you pointed out about the poetic element, the mm -hmm. details of the bend. Do you think that that is something that, is, uh, that the architects are losing? Uh, and if so, do you think it is something that can be developed in the future generation? Yeah, unfortunately they are losing it uh, because what's happened as uh, the gentleman has expressed about this problem that we architects have in not being properly connected to the society. What has happened is that globalization, the homogenization of architecture has happened here as it's happened in all the cities of the world. So. You're no longer seeing shop houses. You're seeing modernist shop houses, but they don't express Vietnamese identity anymore. Do they meet the needs of the people living there? They may or may not. So they're no longer to... using those poetic elements, right? They're no longer using those because global modernist architecture doesn't think of those things, right? So it's unfortunate. We're lo we're, they're losing this because it's an important part of Vietnamese identity, I think. Does that answer your question? Is there some hopeful future for them to develop in some way to retain that, develop a new version? Well, you know, the architectural heritage is extremely important in a culture. Cultures that understand their heritage and protect them are able to keep the society moving along. and. Uh, it takes a long time in every culture for this to happen, but it's, it's beginning to happen here. It's beginning to happen. This new book that I mentioned that's coming out is going to be, I think, a big part of showing the Vietnamese people their heritage in modernist architecture and the poetic touches that made it so important in expressing Vietnamese identity. So it's those kinds of steps of making people awareness of their own history and their own architecture, which hasn't... No books have been written about this before. That's very unfortunate. Nobody had a means of discovering what this was all about. So more and more uh, young people stepping up and defining this creates awareness and eventually it creates lists of buildings that need to be saved. And that then becomes heritage protection. Okay, here's another question from Facebook. Uh -huh. Good. Is there an historic regulatory agency of any kind to preserve some of the older buildings? Yeah, 
too much of uh, old Saigon is being torn down and replaced with modern. And I make a distinction between modern and modernist. They're modern. They're not necessarily modernist. Modernist, modern hotels and so forth. So yeah, the questioner is correct. That's exactly what happened. Is there a historic regulatory agency? Well, there, um, I'm asking Tim Dolling here, who's written an uh, amazing book about Saigon's history and its heritage and an argument for the value of heritage. Um, there have been some successes recently. Uh, the uh, old administrative building of the French colonial government at the corner of Li Du Chan and, and Dom Khoi streets was, was slated to be torn down by the Ho Chi Minh City government to build a new administrative center for Ho Chi Minh City government. And uh, through the Facebook groups, the Heritage Observatory group, the Saigon Then and Now group, uh, there was a petition drive by Vietnamese citizens not by us expats, um, that gained enough signatures that it convinced the government to delay that plan or to save that building. And they've been working towards figuring out how to save the building, what they would build otherwise, either elsewhere or else on the other portion of the block. So there, there is hope now for heritage uh, protection here. But, until they have lists of buildings identified for good historic and aesthetic and social values. Uh, it's very hard to say buildings as they get torn down before you realize they're gone. Uh, so for the first time now, we've got um, French colonial villas in District 3 protected because there's a list now, finally, this last year. Okay, I would agree with that. Um, yeah, but in, in talking to the government architects that I know that have been involved in that, they would like to now add uh, modernist villas in District 3 to that list, and eventually it's got to make its way through all of the historic buildings, uh, especially in District 1. And so it's got a long ways to go before we have a real regulatory agency here to preserve older buildings. And then we're going to, in the meantime, we're going to lose a lot more heritage here. Hi, yeah. So um, you sort of answered this question a bit um, by saying about the people just aren't educated in their modernist heritage. Um, but I wonder why, if mod if modernism was linked to the new identity of Vietnam, why they've decided to break from that, or at least not recognize that in the modern day, and that the new generation of Vietnamese artists wouldn't be given that as the foundation of their architectural heritage. And I've gone around a lot of places in Vietnam, and uh, Vin Group especially, kind of the development that they tend to do, I found a bit creepy because it kind of replicates um, French um, streets and it feels very inauthentic and it feels like they're grasping at, at something which doesn't feel is actually theirs. And I wonder, is that um, an idea of what wealth is um, or an idea of what um, success is meant to look like? Um, but it doesn't feel like, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not sure how to phrase my question, but it's, it's, uh, why aren't they building on that modern, modernist heritage when it is clearly the predominant, um, thing that you can see architecturally, um, why are they trying to take something which is European? Um. Okay, uh, great, good question. Uh, the second part of that question about the faux colonial architecture, which has been proliferating here and definitely in Hanoi, 
I'm going to address the first thing I'm going to address in the next presentation on the 18th of November because architecture communicates a, a civilization's values. Um, and what kind of values are we communicating now here? So there's a social problem here that architects have and the society has a disconnect someplace. But the first part of your question is good. Is what you're asking about is the education, and, and not just of architects, but uh, artists, but also the population itself. And you rightly point out that with this beautiful heritage that we have here of modernist architecture here, why aren't we building on that? Um, complicated question. It, it's related to my coming here 15 years ago wanting to write a book about what I saw in 1979. How did this happen? How did this Vietnamese architecture happen? Um, and not finding any books written by Vietnamese people or architects or academics, and still today, none. When you don't have um, people writing books, writing articles, giving presentations, uh, to help make people aware of this uh, tremendous architectural accomplishment of their own civilization, um, then it becomes very difficult, as we have found, uh, to protect heritage. Uh, so it's being worked on. Um, the books are coming, the articles are coming, more and more heritage. The Facebook groups have been very, I think, very instrumental and building awareness here now. The uh, Saigon Observatory group, the Saigon Then and Now group, groups in particular in building um, the awareness of heritage. So I, I think the answer is coming, but it's taking a long, grinding time uh, to get there. Thank you. Hello. Hi, um, you know, thank you for the work because um, I'm I'm very surprised to um, to realize that we have a lot of gems in the city, right? Um, and I just came back from the West, from from America, and, and and I didn't realize that you know this is this is a great work that you've done and collected, um, and I think I, I don't know how much um, it has been uh, advertised or publicized, but I think these are or cultural heritage, as you said. Is a culture has its sides, basically, and uh, and I think the the next generation because they don't know, right? Um, they're too busy copying the you know uh, the West, basically the, the Westernized, right? So that's why they're copying all the condos, and these buildings are, are in, in in the uh, is in danger. It's going to be torn down by the the developers' vultures, and they're going to build another um, commercial sites. Um, and I think, you know, when you buy in house, I think the private sectors have to do more. You can't rely on the government anywhere, right? Um, so, so, you know, I hope you do more exhibitions like this in, in a larger location. I think a lot of uh, wealthy individuals, they are looking for uh, new ways to, to, um, to be recognized, to, to, to basically, you know, show more of being Vietnamese rather than, than just in a copy of, of, of the Western world. Um, and and uh, I think this should be publicized. This, this should be be known more, so that we preserve these Vietnamese individualism, right? Vietnamese unique uh, creativity, right? Because now everything is a copy uh, around the city. And 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 I love the fact that that you bring this out uh, today. And I'm glad I'm here today. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, you know, there's only 50 people here, so I see what you mean, but. I was astonished to find out from the American Center that in the last presentation two weeks ago about modernist architecture in general, there were 6,600 people that followed the live stream of that presentation on Facebook. I was amazed, you know? So <laughs> presumably out there, you know, there's another 6,000, 7,000 people that have been watching this presentation. So. It gets out there. Thank you very much to the American Center for, for hosting these uh, sessions on, on architecture. I think they're very important. And I, lo I love this technology of not only having, because I, 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 when I present, I love having people see and, and see how they respond. And that helps me a lot. But you know, to know that there's 6,000, 7,000 people out there is 
uh, very gratifying to know. So, another question from Facebook. Okay. In terms of photography, I really like your photos, although they're not my photos. They're photos primarily of Alexander Gorel, who takes very interesting architectural photographs. Most of the photographs are his. The historical ones from 1971-72 were mine when I was here. It helps enhance the beauty of architecture, no question. I agree with that. Incredible photographs. Can you share some tips on how to take good photos of architecture? What kind of gear do you use? Well, <laughs> uh, there are all kinds of architectural photographers, and uh, they're like architects and artists. They're, well, they're artists, period. Uh, they have their means and methods, and uh, they're different because they're trying to express different things. Um, Alexander Gorel clearly uses very interesting angles on buildings that architectural photographers normally would never use. It was a little bit frustrating for me at first when we'd be bringing in photographs and I'm trying to describe them in the book and they weren't what I expected of architectural photography. It's definitely different. But in the end, they're so beautiful and, and emotional that they communicate the beauty and the, the spirit, the Vietnamese identity of these buildings so well. But uh, what kind of gear does he use? He uses a 35 millimeter camera. It's got a uh, tilt control lens, you know, uh, perspective control. So the lines are vertical. He's, he's got what he needs to do architectural photography. Uh, but he's, I, I worked with another architectural photographer, a, Vietnam, a Japanese photographer who photographed my house after it was built six years ago and was published. A uh, very careful photographer. It took him 45 minutes to set up a shot. He's very, very perfect. Whereas Alex, I followed him around a couple of days taking photographs. He whizzes through a building. Shoot, shoot. He doesn't, he doesn't set up the photo, but he's got this eye for architecture and an eye for culture and an eye for what people are doing in buildings. It's incredible. So I'm sorry, I can't answer your question directly, but um, I hope I gave you the sense of it. Go ahead, Michael. Go ahead. Oh, you need a... Got a microphone. Now I'm, I'm beginning to finally understand where that comes from. I'm standing over. Here. Yeah. Okay. I'm a photographer. I was a photographer in the United States for almost 50 years. Uh, part of what I did was architecture. Um, one of the elements is going there at the right time of day. So you, I would usually go to the location and scout it. I would also have a compass with me so I could tell you know, where the sun was coming up, where the sun was setting, where the shadows would be falling. It's just like any other discipline, it's paying attention to achieve the results that you want to get. And fortunately, in the digital realm, you have instant feedback. So if you, your vision is not matched by what you see on the back of your camera, you can make adjustments on the fly. And it's just being aware of the what you want to convey and then commu uh, communicating that through the camera because photography is a blend of art and uh, craft technical aspects you have to be very you've had to be technically proficient but you also have a, to have an artistic eye and i would agree with uh, mel that uh, alexandra has has done a fantastic job he's a far much far better architectural photographer than i was it's just a matter of paying attention and uh getting the results that you want. Of course, unfortunately, our book was published in black and white. Um, the printing quality just isn't that good. Um, so um, you saw here today, at least, the, the, the high definition uh, color photographs. That gives you a better sense. Any other questions? One last question. Uh, okay, sir. You mentioned your house. Is that here? Yeah, it's right there. It's, that, that's uh, your house. That's my house. Uh, it's, oh. it's in the Tunfu. <laughs> it's in the Tunfu district. Okay. Thank you all very much. We had great questions. Uh, looking forward to you all coming back uh, on the 18th of November.